Hello and welcome to a new episode of B2B e-commerce integrated. My name is Arno and I'm the chief product officer here at Sana Commerce. And with Sana Commerce, we believe that by using ERP integrations, B2B companies are more successful than B2B companies that are using mainstream e-commerce solutions. You do not have to replicate the data logic around complex pricing, stock orders and quotes in multiple systems. And there is no need to maintain the data logic in various systems. And more importantly, less prone to error by making ERP and commerce work as one. This results in better relationships with your B2B buyers and more commercial success. So in, in this podcast, I'm interviewing the most important people in B2B e-commerce, our IT folks or technology-minded people. So before we jump into the interview, um, if you enjoyed listening, uh, please leave a rating or review uh, on the different channels so you will help your peers to find this content easier and better. So I am super excited today because I have two very special guests from Sweden. So true B2B e-commerce experts in the show, I have to say. You might know them from their LinkedIn video snippets about B2B e-commerce, which I really love and follow as well. So please uh, welcome Helena Stroll and Nicholas Helgesen. So welcome. Thanks. Nice to be Thank here. You. Great. Great, great. Thanks for uh, taking the time. So yeah, we are going to talk about uh, a lot of things of B2B, how, why B2B companies should invest in this, uh, what are the pitfalls and learnings, all the things you have experienced over the, uh, the past when, uh, yeah, when, when doing your business. But let's start um, with, with you, Helena. Can you please introduce yourself to the, uh, to the audience? Yeah, so uh, I have worked with B2B e-commerce for over a decade now. It was a little bit, I, just, I was an IT consultant and I just started on a project and I just got into it and I loved it. And I usually joke and say like, if you want to b- sell a dress online, I have nothing to offer you, but Jesus Christ, give me a spare <laughs> part or like a chemical <laughs> pa- compound that is bought in bulk and I'm all yours. <laughs> uh, so okay. unlike, I, I used to say, I, it's me and my fellow B2B e-com nerds. So uh, yeah. Exactly. We are also You're a sit- good company. Yeah. We I also like sit- it as well. Yeah. And we also situated on the west coast of Sweden. So, I mean, there is a lot of mm-hmm. industrial companies here. Uh, so, really fun. It is really, really fun. But, uh, Niklas, awesome. are you uh, going to introduce yourself? Yes, Niklas, please. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I have a background as a systems engineering. So, I started my career as a developer and quickly found out that the business development part was more interesting than the actual code development. So, so in 1997, we started building our own e-commerce platform and... I've done that project a couple of times since then, but I've also been working as the e-commerce manager or, or CTO, CIO, etc. In, in different roles, both as a, on the customer side, but also as a consultant. So, so we've been doing this for quite a while, and, and it's also very exciting to see to all the technology that comes into the B2B sphere right now. So, so it's a good time to be in B2B e-commerce, definitely. Definitely. Awesome. Great. So, um, and, and Elena, you are now part of a company that's doing a lot of consultancy, right? So you have, um, you, you, and, but it are two separate companies. Or are, you, are you also working together or are you only making the videos uh, together? Me, me and Niklas joke that we're actually competitors uh, because we, we actually <laughs> do the same thing, but for two different companies. We are competitors because uh, they, uh, I'd say that the, uh, about the average size of the companies are the same. We both work in e-commerce, B2B mm-hmm. consultancies. Uh, and we have discussed getting some kind of commercial collaboration but right now we are only doing the uh, marketing collaboration which has been very successful i'd say so so it's a, very it's fun. a collaboration I mean, between swan swan enemies or swan competitors but it's, it's fun yeah. it's very cool cool all right so let, let's start with you nicholas uh, um, why do you think b2b e-commerce uh, or b2b companies should invest in in b2b e-commerce uh, if they have not started that yet in uh, so and it would be a good goal for 2023 what would be your main reasons for that uh, yeah definitely I, I i if i turn that around and say why why shouldn't they because the mm-hmm. uh, uh, the technology is uh, very mature today compared to 10 years ago so there's a lot of commercial off-the-shelf products that you can get quite cheap and fast. And uh, there is also a lot of statistics done, studies, that says that the, the B2B customers actually require these kind of solutions. So, so uh, I usually say, like uh, Helena does, that uh, uh, can, can you afford to sit this one out? Because uh, you probably can't. So, so if, you, if you don't go uh, setting up a digital sales channel for your B2B, you're probably going to become extinct quite soon. Because I mean, the customers, had... uh, 
Yeah, we we even yes, had please, Elena, yeah. yeah. We even had some customers that said like this was sometimes it's B2B, sometimes it's literally like this e-commerce, but sometimes it's more like a customer portal. Sometimes it's not so obvious that it's like this cart, you maybe more order services or you do scheduling or so on. But we even have a customer that said we have to get it because right now we are losing customers. So how do you argue like return on investment? Well, the return on investment, if we don't do this, our customers to go to someone else. So the return on investment is basically we get to keep our companies and customers and we are still in business. And if we are good at this, we might even do further. Correct, correct. Yeah, that's also what we uh, what we hear a lot. And uh, yeah, Nicholas, what you mentioned is also interesting. And I, I, I agree with you that there are so many um, different technologies, so many different platforms um, in the world now that that have adopted, let's say, the the B two B trend or wave and and added that functionality or parts of that uh, to their solutions. So uh, I, there are uh, different angles, different approaches, different technologies to choose from. So um, it, yeah, from a technology perspective, there should be no limitations, right? It's just uh, just do yeah, it, just start uh, start doing it. I think it. that's fun if if I can just in, in, uh, because uh, we talk about that in Elena. And sometimes we meet clients that says, our business is too complicated. You cannot digitize this because we have this machine. We have this blah, blah, blah. And then we say, please challenge us because I, I dare you that at least 90% of your business could be digitized today with commercial off-the-shelf products. And then you have 10%, of course, uh, that you can't. But start with the ones that are easy. And, and you can make huge uh, pr- progress in the digitization Especially now, if we go into a recession, there's a mm-hmm. lot of cost savings to be done with automating yeah. things like customer service, in-house sales, the quotation flows. There's a lot of things you can use commercial off-the-shelf products just to automate, and then you can save huge amount of costs. So it's not just only a matter of driving the sales; it's also a matter of uh, optimizing and, and, and automating flows. I mean, correct, you could correct. Make, you can compare to in retail if you work in fashion. You say that every time you touch a garment, it costs money. So everything yeah. in fact is around the, is ra- regarding touching the garment as little as possible because as soon as you do that it costs money. And if you look at B2B there is a lot of like okay first there's a manual order handling then it's the manual trying to understand which warehouse we're going to source it from because we have four different warehouses then we manually need to understand the customer's discount and what it means for the order then we manually have to reschedule the order because the date that was promised to the customer it was actually not in stock so we couldn't do it so if you look at many of these cost processes there could be very many manual steps that are currently being done and no one really see them because overall it's just like, oh, we have too much cost. It's not really that it's seen as order cost. But I mean, if you start looking at some of these companies, how many orders a customer care agent or like a sales guy can take per day, if you just take their salary and start dividing up the hours, you're going to realize that, oh my God, we are, it's costing a lot of money. And uh, mm-hmm. But but I mean, and I, I I agree with you because also one part is of course the quotation process where, where you actually request the quotation and uh, some of these companies use emails or you call someone and they are probably away playing golf etc. So I think mm-hmm. you can also measure the time from quotation to to deliver the order as a factor in this and and just shorten that with automation automation. Correct. And then you do not even talk about all the things that can go wrong with all those manual interactions and that you have to return things because it was wrongly ordered or whatsoever, right? There is then also an, another huge pile of waste or costs. So yeah, you, I, I'm every time surprised with all those investigations that that there are still so many manual processes, right, in B2B companies. That That, that is crazy. And I think one of the things what comes in, why is B2B e-commerce then complex? Well, it is because If you do all these manual processes, you have a lot of usually manual handling for making up for things that doesn't really work. Like, okay, yeah, Mm -hmm. but I know that this is an old spare part. So that's why I always double check if it has been obsolete. Okay, but you don't actually know that. You just know it because you work with it for a long time. So you have all, this is just an example, but usually you end up having a lot of processes that you think are working smooth, but actually it's a lot of manual handholding. And when you try to do B to B to be e-commerce, it's like the the ocean and the tidal wa- wa- the tidal water go away, and you are currently exposed and realize, well, actually we are doing this so manual that our first step of making this complex is that we actually need to understand how to digitize these projects product uh, processes at all to be able to do them because right now they cannot be. It cannot be based on a judgment call from somebody if they're going to check if it's obsolete or not. You have to have that in the database and you have to know it. You have to explain it to the customer in the UI. And I think that is usually bringing 
a lot of complexity. If you if you haven't already started, I think this is one of the complex things you will do. How does our process look like and how can it be digital when you have a lot of manual steps where manual hand where manual like hand work is actually done on different orders? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Very very fair point. And <laughs> and then if you need to if you want to start automating that or had I, I also talk with a lot of companies and they say yeah they are afraid for yeah this will be a huge investment because everything what you just said yeah we need to we need to transform this we need to investigate it and and, and the in general what is the average lead time or or, or a typical project in from your opinion Nicholas that how, how such a process should look like or what can you take as an average time to go online with with a with a B2B store store what you uh, what you have experienced. I, I, I get that right, right away. I just want to inject one thing about B2B being complex because okay, sure. uh, even without digitization the, the actual sales process is different than in, mm-hmm. in B, uh, consumer business because in consumer business True. every customer is similar. They have the same some have a discount and some have don't don't. It's the same stock, it's the same pricing. They buy for list price. And there's of course VAT added and we talk a lot about B2B is not just removing the VAT. Because in B2B, many of the customers are unique, that you have a unique uh, agreement and you have a, a, a line of store credit and you have some requisites that the customer has to buy for a certain volume. They have discounts on categories, on different payment terms, etc. So, so the actual transaction is unique per customer. Uh, and that's also some of the things that modern systems are good to incorporate. But that's one of the worries from the customers that can we get this? Can sales get the correct commission? Can the customer get the exact price for this category yeah, and they buy this and they have this, etc. Sure in this agreement, the customer got really good price because we only delivered on them on Wednesdays. That's actually why they have such a big discount on the list price because they have only Wednesday deliveries. How do we make sure when they order something online, they also just get it on Wednesdays because that is our <laughs> whole commercial agreement why we have been pressured on this. Yep. I mean, yep. and I want to say one thing cool. more that's yeah. complex. That is Interesting. Always complex. That is yeah, sure. having the data because I think always having the correct source systems with the data, that is like the biggest challenge uh it's mm-hmm. not finding a good bureau that could make you a good concept there are tons of them and there, yeah. there are some that even were good in this b2b commerce but it's like ha- getting your own ducks <clears throat> in the and knowing do we have customer data that is set up coherently well you probably don't okay do we have product data yeah you have some but you probably don't have everything you need do we have install based data well probably not because very few are actually really good at that if we're going to be honest uh, do we have pricing or is the pricing done manually when we invoice so usually you have all these types of, I usually call them like the Lego bricks. Like if you don't have the Lego bricks, then you doesn't matter if you have a good, nice, if you have the nice uh, house, build of the house, you have to have all these bricks. And I think that is what I see many people are struggling with. Then the people on different levels, some have the basics, but they of course have higher ambitions. Now we want to do this also. We want to tell them if you buy this spare part, you should also buy this spare part because you should probably change those together. Okay. Where do we keep that data? Well, we don't currently have it. So I think depending mm-hmm. on where you are, data is always going to be one of the big challenges. Yeah, so you need to have these foundations really in good place. It's not only about, okay, let's buy some tool, make a shiny front end, and your B2B will succeed. It's, it's, it's I think, yeah, if I le- hear you clearly, uh, Elaine, it's also about all the, the things behind it, the processes, the data. It, needs, it all needs to work hand in hand. And uh, yeah, that was funny enough that it was also the same more or less the same kind of conversation I had yesterday with two guys from the uh, from the hard truth about B2B e-commerce from an agency from the US. They uh, that also do a lot of B2B. They say, yeah, we are not even taking projects if they just come to them and say, ah, guys, can you make a nice front end for our B2B? Uh, use, uh, doesn't matter which tool they are using because they say, yeah, anyway, the project will fail because if you can have a, a beautiful front end, but if this pricing rules will not be reflected or if the data is not correct on spare parts that you need to buy this and maybe this as well, then the adoption rates will anyway drop doesn't matter how beautiful it is, uh, adoption rate will drop or it will not be adopted at all and you have a failed project. And I think that is where we're coming to the first things. Like the first thing is you could argue that you could could potentially go live with e-commerce without people being able to place an order because just the fact mm-hmm. that customers can go in and see your stock level and their price is already a step forward that they usually now, if they don't have it today, of course, need to email in. Sometimes you can argue that if you don't have B2B e-com at all and customers like mm-hmm. call, email in, or you meet them, just having a solution 
where you can actually, in the beginning, just search, find prices and see if it's available. And that could actually be enough for an MVP. Maybe you don't even can place the order, but just the fact of about exposing this information to your mm -hmm. customer, they can easily find it without being able to contact you. That's actually something that already has a value. That and saves a lot of time uh, on the on the on the customer service and so uh, on because uh, they don't have to call. I, I agree because in in B two B, many of the cases are more of a digital transformation for the entire organization than just setting up a web front and start selling things online. So so we also do more of a how, how do you consume an elephant? You do it one bite at a time to set yeah. up an MVP, and that might be that you work only with a certain market or a certain assortment or certain level of customers. Just yeah. because the, the old way of thinking where you had a project that was 18 to 24 months, I dare to say you that no one in the organization will remain for such a long change management project. And also the technology will probably be obsolete in two years that you started to build. So it's yeah. very, very important to get some of the core interfaces or, or the cash register, etc. up and running in a short period of time. I said that's yeah. key. Yeah, no, clear, clear. These, these are already some, some great tips, I think, for the... For the audience, yeah. So, so how to how you can start slower because, yeah, sometimes they are so afraid that they say this is such a huge project, yeah. but you can already get benefits uh, from from small par parts and start MVP. Yeah. And what I what I also really um, liked from the pre talk we had, Helena, and maybe you can explain is how yeah how how you you work with clients in let's say visualizing all those processes or um, have, having having workshops. I, I I also saw on your Instagram page you're doing workshops with customers. How you yeah what do you do to bring these processes that are all manual to the surface well it's just to work i mean this is like the oldest profession in the it book like being a business analyst and doing process yes. mapping together with the customer or they do it themselves i think that is i never say like if unless you have this i will start on the project making this that's what i do to help to work together with the customer and make this happen that, mm -hmm. That's and I think it's it's of great value sometimes to be able to just show a visual and say this is how this process is made because maybe there's not a common view over it. Everybody knows their little part, but this is actually how it's being made, and this is actually then the customer experience. They get an email at this point of time, and then they get an email on this point of time, and what happens in between there they don't really know. So I just mm -hmm. try to work a lot together with the customer. I think some of. I, we had a project for yeah. a client for uh, the, where the, the initial sketch they brought us with their ID that was like on an iPhone 4 or 5 frame. And then you can imagine how all that idea was. The problem is not the idea. The problem is to have the grit resilience and uh, just being able to like, you know, pull off sleep and sleeves and, and pull through the idea. I think that is a lot where it comes to that. This is not going to be an easy plug and play where you can download Shopify and have plug and play within like a weekend. Sure, you can have that for some kind of POC or so on. But if you're really going to get it to work with your custom unique prices and everything, it's just a lot of hard work. And it's a lot of hard yes. work. And one of the crucial factors is in doing so, it's really like Niklas mentioned before, finding the MVP, not trying to do everything. Mm -hmm. Slice the elephant, find something you can start with, a specific market, a specific part of your assortment, or a specific, uh, like, you know, vertical, whatever, to find something you can start doing and, and do it. I think that's uh, the way forward yeah. to, to find an MVP. Well, correct. And and, and also what you mentioned about that visual aspect, I, I was really triggered about that. So I think that is often forgotten people making long documents with all those processes being described. But as you mentioned that earlier, let's say painting the, the Disney picture of a process, right? Making it really yeah. sim I'm simple, gonna, but attractive. Yeah, yeah I'm going to credit this to a, a, a woman I work with called Eva. She was the one that taught me the expression <laughs> Disney slide. Like having, even if something is complex, you can make a, a more easy an easy view of it that's kind of like a Disney slide it's easy <laughs> it's almost entertaining you understand it immediately to have a Disney slide that explains something I think that is uh, really important both uh, to have a Disney that, slide that, that is really really funny that, that, yeah. I, I like that because I sometimes get uh, um, criticism from, from clients for showing mm -hmm. them the nuclear blueprints for, for the power plant <laughs> and they don't follow yeah. me so I, I think that's very very important and something that we all perhaps need to get better at just to simplify yeah. things 
No, 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 of course. Had to and, and, and paint these processes. So we also at Sana we we also started, I think only only recently, of course, we did we did a lot of analysis phases, but now we have more like business process workshops, make it visual uh, because we see that companies are being really helped with that. It's not only oh, yeah. about implementing the tool, it's also about understanding their own processes, strangely yeah, enough. Yeah, but it is yeah, it just they need some help for that. And, yeah, and I, I, think, I think that's important, Arno, because uh, the 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 uh, if you look into the, the trialing with people process and technology the technology is today actually the easy part the hard part is the people and the process because mm -hmm. if you go into this digitization process it's, it's a transformation for some of the companies uh, and, and also the staff the organization need also to change the mindset the skill set etc to be part of this and and we, we did a post about how you can uh, life hack your e-com costs just by training the staff in using the tool because there's a gap or, 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 uh, almost all the time in the skills for, for the people who work in the system and the system because uh, common B2B systems are quite complex today. There's a lot of functionalities. Yeah, yeah. no, correct. And, and then they're forgetting what is all in the box and they are trying to customize it or propose to say, hey, this is not working. But they, as soon as they start learning the tool or invest time there, you can uh, you can indeed hack your own system or explore it and, and get value more value out of it. Cool, um, you, Helena. You had also something else you want. You were, I was, I think, interrupting you, or was 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 that was it also something you wanted to uh, to share? Otherwise, we can maybe Let's move to the to on. the next top. Yeah. So the so the main reason I think we have already a couple of lessons, but the main reasons why, from your opinion, why B two B e commerce projects fail, I think is I already heard one is that if you're taking it too big, right? So slice the elephant. That is that is that is already one. Um, I think also not having your data in order is also. An important one, but is is there maybe something else you want you would like to add or that you have seen while working with projects? Oh, Nicholas first. Nicholas, right? I think I think Nicholas. one. Um, I think it's more important to find the the uh, uh, agency or bureau or, or implementation partner that understands your business needs because there's uh, some agencies mm -hmm. and partners that will uh, do as they're told and, and yeah. they will invoice it, of course. But as, if if you go to the dentist and say I want to remove all my teeth. The bad dentist will do that and invoice you. The good dentist will say, we can fix this. There's a filling in two on ones and, and, and we can fix them and you can keep yeah. your teeth for the rest of your life. To find the agency and partner that can also make uh, counter requirements for the customer to, to, to benefit there. There's a, like a, a synergy. And I think many products fail because the agency doesn't understand the core mm -hmm. needs for, for the client. Uh, yeah. So it's not a technology factor, but it's a fit. And, and there's, a lot, there's a lot of money in B2B e-commerce. There's a lot of hungry agencies who want to be part of this. But I think there are some, some ones that probably should work with something else or, or to sell dresses online, need, et cetera. You definitely yeah. need experience, and that comes over the years, right? It's not You need to have done a couple of projects to really understand yeah. it. But, and and but it's Helene, not just a matter of removing the VAT, et cetera. As we will say, no, it's, no, it's no, no, that's for yeah. sure. Or, or, or just make, uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, more products display more in a list or something, and then it's B2B. Yeah. No, that's not the case. Helena, also throw it to you, maybe, uh, uh, because you wanted to share also something um, uh, on this. Yeah, so I, what, what I, have you experienced? No, but I think one is, um, I'm, I'm thinking of t on two, on top of what we yeah. already talked about. So the first one I'm thinking a bit about, often when you're like in the early phases, you maybe do a pre-study mm -hmm. or something, then you usually get some kind of concept. Okay, this is would what, this would be really nice if we can offer our customers. But then you have yeah. the reality. You have the reality of this is the data that we have. You may also have the reality like, yeah, but... <laughs> We don't know the shipping cost when people place orders because we do the shipping cost by the invoicing. Okay, so if we want to show shipping in the checkout, that's actually not an IT problem. That is a business process problem because then we need to change how we do shipping at all in our company. And of course, one yeah. can change that. But I think often that's where you have a very big gap. You have a gap between the ideas, the really nice ideas, and the reality. And a lot of work that I do is... Of course, you have to challenge yourself. You have to challenge if we should change anything, but you have to consider this gap and consider how to bridge it. Either usually you do a little bit on both sides, but you have to consider how to bridge it because otherwise you end up in these really fancy sketches and all of a sudden a developer is going to work with it and he's like, the data is not really at all describing what you are trying to describe. And then in the middle of a sprint, that's when it's discovered. And I have done this myself. In the middle of a sprint, discovered how we thought something worked it's not at all actually mm -hmm. how it works. And I think that is something that you should triples over. And what has happened then is that you probably have set a very high bar that you have introduced to your executive team and the steering group. 
and that's what people are after. And then reality hits and you realize we might not be able to do all that. So I think having that gap in mind and, and, and understanding what are we actually dealing with and are we planning to change the ERP system? Because if we are not, then we have to consider what we have in our ERP system and make it work. And trust me, usually it doesn't just, oh, let's also change the ERP system. That does not happen. So that is one thing. And the other thing is, of course, to have a successful rollout. How do you get your customers onto it? How do you make sure yeah. the customers, even if people say they want it, it is a big work to roll it out, market it to new customers. But for B2B e-commerce, I mean, the first thing is usually taking the customers that right now are doing things manually and getting them into the digital channel. And I think that is something that is often forgotten, but it's very, very important. So that's also where you can fail. No. Really? And when it comes into this change management, expectation management, especially if you're doing an MVP, will, mm-hmm. how, will they, how do you get people maybe to accept that you, we don't have everything? We are right now here. And maybe some, I usually say often it's easier for the users to accept than like the local market and the sales department because they are saying, unless we have every, this and this and this and this, you are not going to go live with my customers. Not because the customers said it, because they said it. So I think it's a lot of change management and education and I also I, it's not hard for an IT development team to work in sprints and work agile like they know that it's hard for the business side to understand that they're going to get things per, like piece by piece and not in one big go so I think that yes, is something yes. we really fail uh, great 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 lessons and actually yeah, we have maybe another topic a little bit later on on how you can uh, Increase the adoption, but I already learned one tip is that do not forget that in the initial project or that you say adoption is also part of the project. It's not done when the site is live. It is when it's adopted and, and, and really in, in, in use. So, yeah, uh, w- w- what is in your opinion? Uh, may- let's start with you, Nicholas, the, uh, the raw importance of ERP integration or working uh, integration maybe in general with, with the different uh, systems of record for B2B? Uh, I, I say that's core and that's also one part of where some of the products fail because you have played down the role of that uh, mm-hmm. and, and it's also of course business data from the ERP but what we see lots of uh, uh, go, com- coming right now or, or being present is the uh, implementation of CDPs where you can get yeah. the 360 of the clients because yeah, customer data platform uh, yeah. yeah and that, that's also core and, and uh, as you men- mentioned Arno to have access to real-time data from both the ERP and the CDP, etc. So I say that, that, that's the driver for business, I'd say, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and that is often uh, forgotten or and does it also yeah. not really matter what kind of technology you uh, you use. Of course, with SANA, we focus yeah. on that. But yeah, we are only supporting two, two ecosystems, so we can also only help a small part of the market. Yeah. Uh, but the yeah, so SAP and, 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 and Microsoft Dynamics, however, um, uh, uh, I think more important here is just to understand that this is also an important ingredient for any project you take on in B2B and that you need to yeah, uh, find the right agency or right partner that can help you then have, have actually understanding and have done it before, right? Uh, try, try to ask for some proof or something like that, that they, uh, that yeah. they can make it work because otherwise, uh, yeah, we also see, or we actually taking over projects where, where this was a mistake that they, uh, that they choose a partner that is more focused on retail. They can make beautiful retail stores, but then they do one B2B project and that's filled, for example, on this part on integration or they forgetting it completely. They didn't even quoted it or they didn't even uh, uh, start thinking about it so uh, yeah, from your perspective uh, oh, yeah, you, yeah, you, sure. just to uh, because i also think that with the right partner uh, etc because there are some uh, coming to the anti integration is where you put master data should, should this be master data in the erp the cdp or the ecom etc so i think there's a, a high grade of importance to have that uh, discussion before going into the partnership and, and the systems and uh, the, the need for real-time data is key today because, especially in B2B, uh, and we, we run into customers that has setups where there are some batch job run each 24 hours, etc. But but they quickly run into business uh, issues with that. Yeah, can you, maybe that's interesting. Can you elaborate a little bit? Like say that is then not synchronized or something or that is then too late or too, the, the, the data refresh is too late? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think there are, there are there, of course there's a plethora of different platforms and, and or agencies and how things are set up the architecture but we, we see uh, that the customers that has this come to us with the need for having real-time data because also their clients want to have the yeah. uh, ability to pull 
pricing, stock availability, etc. in real time. And in B2B, each customer is unique. So you need to have access to that data being either calculated or pulled in real time because yeah. you cannot use the uh, old way of thinking with batch updates, etc. That's uh, uh, very obsolete in B2B, I'll say. Yeah, and I think sometimes what happens when you do this big batch is that you start to duplicate logic. You might have a pricing logic yeah. saying if you buy this and this and this, then you always get 10%. And the ERP system knows that. Yep. And, and then it's better that you just ask for the prices right away and the ERP system calculates yep. all that because otherwise you basically have to integrate the price conditions. And then, I mean, that's never going to work. That's, I, I, it's just, it's no. a nightmare already when I hear myself saying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can understand. Yeah, we have, we have seen it all. Um, the people that, that, that have seen it, they, 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 they know it's a, it's a nightmare. And that's also the, the main reason why I started this podcast, because there are still so many customers that are out there and they say, yeah, why is it not working to have a B2B? And uh, I'm trying to get it working or kind of trying to get this complex pricing in. I'm synchronizing it or with batch processes, but every time failing. Uh, then you say, yeah, you need to find the right partner or the right uh, agency or the right technology uh, for the right purpose. And that is, uh, and, and, and not uh, go for only that shiny front end, uh, but it should be and a nice shiny front end or a nice experience, but also everything behind it should function like a, like, like a charm. Otherwise, yeah, you will have issues with, um, with, with adoption. So no, th- that, is, that is clear. So and about adoption, then uh, you shared already that tip eh, a few minutes ago about do not forget about it. But are there other ways or maybe advices you give to your customers to increase adoption or if they are having struggles with adoptions, what, what would you mostly advise? Some of the things we did, and you can argue sometimes it's about the customers and sometimes it's about like local markets, like you roll out the uh-huh. local market. So the most important thing is to have the local market on because then they will drive it. So you have to realize, are you, am I working towards customers right away or am I working towards local mm-hmm. markets? So I have to make the local market want to have this and then they roll it out to their customers. Some of the things we have done was that we introduced like if someone had been quite successful, like more market was really successful, we introduced persons to talk to the other markets so it didn't come from the headquarter or even worse, from consultants at the headquarter. That's not really the best, the best if you do it yourself. And they kind of, you know, was there a little bit as, you know, we called the learn from the pros. What, what we did, maybe you can keep that with the market. So what we did yeah. was take a market that had been very successful and in, and let that market talk to the other markets like at the maybe it was like you know a monthly call or something super user meeting to explain how they were mm-hmm. successful because it was just then you hear it from somebody that actually do it and that was that was one thing the other thing is you can do the same with customers okay do you have some customers that really have used this well can that be a key in like your local mm-hmm. conference or anything like that can you work with instead of doing this manually like one way of doing it is of course that you try to talk to the sales people and then you try to onboard people via the sales po- po- people which is a more manual yeah. process it could also work mm-hmm. but is there also a point of doing it like can we just send out invites do we already know some customer addresses so we could just like pre-set them up as users and send out invites. Could that be an option? So I think you should yeah. look at both of it and also think a little bit like, often this B2B is very industrial and you don't really think about marketing enough. Like how can we package this in somewhere? Can there be a price discount if you start doing it? Or, I mean, mm-hmm. marketing doesn't have to be a price discount. Can we market the fact that you can now don't have to call into customer service and wait, wait 10 minutes? Is that something? And also the, the problem is usually that the people you need to be successful, like the salespeople or the people in customer service, a little bit depending who's taking the orders at your company, they are usually one, their jobs are being threatened by this. And they are the one person yeah. you need to be successful. So Niklas is always yeah. really good at mine, like get salespeople on board from start so that they are <laughs> a part of this. Okay, yeah, maybe Nicholas throw that to you. So that is, that is also part of the adoption is, the, is how to manage that internal resistance, right? Uh, I think Helena is touching something important there because the, the it is the digital transformation for the organization as we mentioned earlier. Yeah. I think to get to get the stakeholder, both the official and the inofficial stakeholders aboard, and it might be with, with sales, we usually show them that this will be a tool for you and it will help you increase sales. And you have some mm-hmm. 
quotation flows so you have some other things you can automate and we make damn sure that there is an UTM tag or a Google Analytics event etc that choose to make sure you get your commission and I can show with the report so you, you every customer you have that orders via the e-commerce solution will be counted to your uh, account that that's because that's li- li- live viewed of course and uh, what we also do sometimes is to, to advise the customer to set up kind of an advisory board where they put some A-level, B-level, and C-level customers of, of their own before we launch, and they can have some inputs. Because we, we, we like this feature just because one part is to get the uh, organization aboard, but also to get the uh, customers of the B2B aboard because there, there are some resistance there as well in some sometimes. So yeah. No, that's, yeah, that's no. a great lesson. And Elena, maybe and something if- to add there? Yeah, but if if you want to talk about resistance, I think to you can o- always when you have this and you demo it for like a market and they're gonna rule it out like okay this is the Australian market they're gonna roll it out to their customers. I mean this is very often mm-hmm. how it is that you have some kind of middleman, especially if you are a big organization. I think there's always this. You always have to open for are there any specific requirements in Australia that we actually cannot get around? Like this is how they do VAT and we have to um, adjust to that. So there might be some things that you legally really have to do, otherwise you cannot do it. But often it's very common that people are like, oh, if only you had this button, this button, this button, this button, and this (laughs) function, then you can roll out. And if you talk to people that are in B2B, like software as a service sales, they are like, it's, it's, there's always some function to blame on. And I think that is important to address that the, 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 the solution is not all just to develop those functions. The solution is to have Correct. a discussion. Can we go live anyhow? If there's one, re- one lesson you learn in software development is be less precious about the work that ships. Dare to go live. Otherwise, you end up sitting in your chamber and trying to make it better. But if you're going to go dare to go live, you have to get potential local markets onto it. And then you have to do the journey so that they understand this, that we are going to go live. This is not the end result. We're going to work continuously, probably for a decade on it and even longer. So I think really thinking about yeah. getting the organization with you and getting local champions. I mean, if you get some local champions that think this is awesome, yeah. they're going to roll it out to their customers. Um, I mean... One customer I, I work with even chose the, co- the companies they wanted to roll out to first as pilot. They knew they were a bit influencers in the industry. Like if they do this, they are like the influencers within our very specific industry. So yeah. how, can you, how can you create influencers? And now I don't mean like Instagram influencers that tell you that you're going to get a new skin. But how <laughs> can you get influencers within your company, within your line of field that can help you push this if they like it? Yeah, so no, that's, that's a great lesson. <clears throat> yeah, they're, yeah, awesome. And uh, and definitely also what we are uh, seeing at SANA, especially for the larger organizations that are working multi-country. Um, and we have all seen that, or at least I have also been part of some of these, you know, days where we have all the owners of the different uh, countries and they all want their specific buttons. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But then we just show the numbers on the screen and say, yeah, but Switzerland is, you know, growing with 300 percent. So it's the same store. So what's going on there? Right. So the um, we are uh, yeah, definitely um, it's not the trick is not there in the special buttons. Of course, regulations you need to follow. Uh, But this is great. This is uh, this is awesome. And also how you explain it is is, is totally clear. Um, Yeah. We, we are rounding off. I, 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 th- I saw we had one more thing about the importance of real-time <coughs> data, but we, um, we mentioned that, yeah. I think, already with, uh, with what Nicholas mentioned, so we can skip that. So maybe to, to, to use, is this, is this something you want to, uh, last thing you would like to share, maybe a lesson or story or some advice or just something? Um, uh, Helena, from your side? Oh, my God. I think no, you- I put you on the spot. <laughs> A little bit uh, before on timeline, how long time does this yeah. take? And then my question is, yeah. from the starting point, from the starting point yeah. that you get the idea or the starting point that you have already set an MVP and now and you already have APIs and you're just going to develop. So I think the starting, the time is very different on when do you measure from? Do you measure from when a developer sets up the uh, dev environment? Is that the starting point? Uh, or do you mm-hmm. measure from the fact that even say, okay, let's do like a concept. We need to have a concept. We need to understand what our business processes yeah. is. So that's just something I want to say. Like the time frame is very depending on where do you measure from. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's a so good that's, point. It's a good point. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely. And, and, and people 
people think also that it can be then so long, but it depends really from where, where you start and what perspective you take. Yeah. And I think it's just funny. When I started working with B2B e-commerce, was it 2011 or 12? I think it was 12. Uh, when I started working in 2012 with this, it, it was really like, you know, all the cool kids, they did like retail because that's when it really came like, you know, with everyone that was going to do online. And I was stuck working with like <laughs> all this <laughs> stuff. And, and now I'm like, and I was like, yeah, it's okay. I'm not on the fancy project. And now it's actually, it is a really interesting area. There's so much to do. I think when some people say people don't know, usually I think that's a bit wrong. There are always people at the company that know, that know this yeah. and can do. The problem is usually most companies, they don't have a competence problem. They have a density problem. The density of the competence they need within their company is too low compared to what they want to do. So like maybe we are here. This is of all our people in our company, this many people can do this type of job. The, prob uh, the problem is to succeed with what we want with our strategy. We need this type of density. So usually it's not that there is no competence. It's just that it's not enough competence to compare to what we want to do. And I think one should always be very humble when one works as a consultant because many things is also just getting somebody that can focus on it. Usually you have somebody working on the line. They are dealing with soy shit of yesterday. So half their time is bought up in other things and they can't even focus. So a lot of it, when you take in a bureau or someone, it's just someone that can really focus on this because everybody else is occupied trying just to make it happen. So I think one should always be very humble that many clients yeah. know a lot, just that it's not about that people are stupid. It's about that you need to have time to just work. And it's a lot of hard work and not so many quick fixes. Correct. Nice. Yeah. Great, uh, great summary. So uh, yeah, last for, from your side, Nick, uh, Niklas, anything, anything you would like to, to share? Uh, as a, yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd recommend for everyone who is uh, decision-making capability with budgets, such as a uh, board member or CEO, CTO, etc., to, to, uh, Realize that we are quite far gone in a paradigm shift in B2B currently. So if you are in an in industrial B2B company, etc., uh, please take a close look on, on B2B e-commerce uh, and, and uh, do, do your DD because if, you're, if you have a solution that you're not confident, confident with or that you feel that the clients has this need, it's almost like with the iPhone, uh, the early adapters, etc., and blah, blah, there's no keyboard or... or uh, like with the Blockbox Bluster versus Netflix. And, and uh, mm -hmm. soon there will be a lot of Netflix for the customers and you don't want to be the last proprietor of a Blockbuster. So, yes. so, so we are quite far gotten. And the technology is very mature. So I think it's uh, almost uh, cheap to buy technology and to mm -hmm. start this product. So the cost is quite, the, the ROI, or ROI is very, very fast on those kind of products. Nice. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, thank you very, very much. I, I, I really love this episode. Uh, I love the energy from you, you two. Um, uh, and, and also the, yeah, we are just three of B2B nerds here, at least here from Europe that, uh, that had a nice conversation. So, uh, yeah, thank you for all the lessons shared. I think the, um, the listeners and viewers on our YouTube channel will love it. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll see you again in, um, in maybe uh, one of your videos or maybe face to face when I'm visiting uh, Sweden or you guys vis visiting the Netherlands, you're more than welcome to, uh, to hop by. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much again oh, for taking you for the time us. and, and see you again.